access to non-local information that is not received by our senses or by our body. Presumably the functional receiving capacity of the body is permanently enhanced following an NDE, which can be compared with the radio received not only channel 1, your own personal consciousness, but at the same time channel 2, 3, 4 and 5, the fields of consciousness of others. William James called this a lower personal threshold of consciousness. This remote non-local communication or entanglement seems also to be demonstrated in remote viewing or non-local perception and in the effect of consciousness on matter like in non-local perturbation or in neuroplasticity where functional and structural changes in the brain are demonstrated following changes in consciousness like in meditation, mindfulness training or placebo which means mind over matter. The interconnectedness with non-local aspects of consciousness also explains apparitions at the moment of death, like being in contact with non-local aspects of the consciousness of a dying person at a distance, the so-called pre-mortal experience, or in a period following death, having the inner feeling of being in contact with aspects of the consciousness of disease relative to so-called post-mortal experience of after-death communications. It happens so often, about 50% of people who have lost their partner and 75% of people who lost a child have this kind of after-death communication. But it is a huge taboo, they don't talk about it. It looks as if a single unusual finding that cannot be explained through widely accepted <coughs> concepts and ideas is capable of bringing about a fundamental change in science. By making a scientific case for consciousness as a non-local and this ubiquitous phenomenon, the few can contribute to new ideas about the relationship between consciousness and the brain because it questions the purely materialistic paradigm in science. Research in NDE seems to be important for our scientific ideas about the mind-brain and mind-body relationship. And it is evident that it is also important for our concepts of life and death. But it is also very important for our health care. We should reconsider the many practical implications and ethical, medical and ethical problems such as the care for comatose of dying <coughs> patients, euthanasia, abortion, or the removal of organs for transplantation from somebody in a dying process with a beating heart in a warm body but with the diagnosis of brain death. I believe and hope that in the near future modern science will include empirical research on unusual subjective experiences that may occur in our consciousness that we will accept non-local concepts that understand how we are unconnected with each other with our endangered planet. Recent research in NE seems to be a source of new insights into the possibility of a continuity of consciousness after physical death. But the near-death experience appears to be a personal rediscovery of an age-old, cross-culture, but seemingly forgotten knowledge. In the past, these experiences were often known under different names, such as visions or mystical, religious or enlightenment experiences and the antiquity they were referred to as to journeys to the underworld. Reports of these mystical experiences, often caused by life-threatening situations such as near drowning, asphyxia, suffocation, exhaustion or high fever, have been prevalent across all times and cultures. Nowadays we would classify most of these cases as near-death experiences. So obviously near-death experiences are by no means exclusive to the past 30 years, although there has been, of course been much more interest in the phenomenon since the publication of Raymond Moody's book Life After Life in 1971-5. For me personally it was astonishing to discover so many identical experiences throughout history and across all religions and cultures, and these experiences have greatly influenced views on death and the possibility of a continuity of our consciousness after physical death. 
Across all types of cultures, people have been convinced that the essence of man, usually known as the soul, <coughs> lives on after the death of the body. I will now quote some reports of striking similarities between the death experience and religious or mystical experiences from the past. In ancient India, some 3,000 years ago, it was said, coming and going is all pure delusion. The soul never comes nor goes. Where is the place to which it shall go when all space is in the soul? When shall be the time for the entering and departing when all time is in the soul? I compare this quote with the modern concept of non-locality, which is a concept without a conventional bodily linked concept of time and space. And in the Upanishads, based on the Vedas, ancient Hindu stories that were passed down orally for thousands of years, it is said, the all-knowing self was never born, nor will it die. Beyond cause and effect, this self is eternal and immutable. When the body dies, the self does not die. The supreme self is beyond name and form, beyond the senses, inexhaustible, without beginning, without end, beyond time, space and causality, eternal, immutable. And in the New Testament, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, I know a person in Christ who 40 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, whether in the body or out of body, I don't know, God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told <coughs> that no mortal is permitted to repeat. Compare this with a near-death experience. So the concept of consciousness independent of our body was well known for ages in all cultures and religions, especially in Eastern countries. But to my surprise, this concept happens to be not even new in our Western scientific world. Recently I came across this picture by Robert Flood, an English medical doctor who in the 17th century already located our emotional life imaginative faculty, intellect, mental processes, memories and visions outside our brain. The drawing also clearly shows the supposed energy connections with our physical body. By quoting the Bible, Ecclesiastes, we can come to the conclusion there is nothing new under the sun. And the Dutch physician Frederick van Eden has said, no other insight is as usual, useful to always be reminded it is not new, it is age old. Since the publication of several prospective studies on NDE, survivors of cardiac arrest, with strikingly similar results and conclusions, the phenomenon of near death experience can no longer be scientifically ignored. It is an authentic experience which cannot be simply reduced to imagination, fear of death, hallucinations, psychosis, the use of drugs or oxygen deficiency. And people appear to, to be permanently changed by an NDE during cardiac arrest of only some minutes duration. According to the studies, the current materialistic view of the relationship between the brain and consciousness held by most physicians, philosophers and psychologists is too restricted for a proper understanding of this phenomenon. There are good reasons to assume that our consciousness does not always coincide with the functioning of our brain. And hence, consciousness can sometimes be experienced separately from the body. I have come to the inevitable conclusion that most likely the brain must have a facilitating and not a producing function to experience consciousness. And by making a scientific case for consciousness as a non-local phenomenon, we must question a purely materialistic paradigm in science. And William James, some hundred years ago, should have added, quote, First, you know, a new theory is attacked as absurd. Then it is admitted to be true, this obvious and insignificant. 
And finally, it's, it is seen to be so important that its adversaries claim that it themselves discovered it. <laughs> For me, science means asking questions with an open mind. Science should be the search for explaining new mysteries, rather than stick with old concepts. And he who has never changed his mind, because he could not accept new concepts, has rarely learned something. I can assure you that I learned quite a lot because of all those patients who were willing to share the ND with me. And they have greatly influenced and changed my views on the meaning of life and death. People with an in-death experience have been my greatest teachers. I realize, now, I realize now that everything originates from consciousness. And I understand that people create their own subjective reality based on their consciousness and create the intention one lives his life. We should recognize that our view of the world is wrong because we do not realize that the world as we see it only derives its subjective reality from our consciousness. Because it is only our consciousness that is determining how we perceive this world. If we are in love, the world around us is beautiful. When we are depressed, our world is like hell. And when we are frightened, made terrified by politicians and the press, our world is full of terror. The mind in its own place and in itself can make a heaven or hell, wrote John Milton even in 1667 in his poem Paradise, Paradise Lost. Regarding what we can learn from people who are willing to share the NDE with others, I would like to quote Jacques Hammarskjöld. Our ideas about death define how we live our life. Because as long as we believe that death is the end of everything we are, we will give our energy toward the temporary and material aspects of our life. And our approach to actual medical and ethical <coughs> problems is shaped in part by our belief in a possible continuity of consciousness after physical death, or in contrast by our conviction that death is the end of everything. These views are usually based on religious beliefs or the lack thereof. In our short-sightedness and sometimes, sometimes willful ignorance, we forget to reflect on the future of our planet, where our children and our grandchildren will have to live and survive. We forget about the sustainability as we are now destroying and exhausting systematically our planet, just because we are living in a competitive materialistic society. We should realize that the harm we cause to each other and to nature ultimately is harming ourselves because we as humans are not only intens intensively interconnected and tangled with each other but also with animals and plants living on our endangered earth. We should stop thinking and acting as if we are better than others because this will always be at the expense of children and other weak delicate creatures around the world. We have to change our personal consciousness, not only to change the way we live, but also to change the way we want to treat, honor and respect other human beings on this planet. When the power of love becomes stronger than our love for power, our world will change and it will require a huge change in consciousness indeed. We should all feel the responsibility for this change. Thank you for your attention.